Welcome to a Verb Moto broadcast. I am your host, Brad Gephardt. I want all of these shows to be completely honest. Like, they can't get me off any of these. Like, three or four shows every single week. And bringing it to you guys because you guys love Moto so much. Can't get enough of it. And neither can I. Neither can my co host, one Zach Heron. Heron Dane, welcome back to the show. What's up, man? Glad to be here. And uh, we got a lot to talk about. It was a great A1. So I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, we do. Before we get too far into things, I want to let everybody know that the Gypsy 500 is a fun endurance race at Mesquite MX March 9th. It's going to be so much fun. I will be there. Uh, the rest of the Verb crew will be there. I think I'm teamed up with Troy. So we're going to get probably second to last, if not last. But the last place team will most likely have Chase Stallo as well as Wes Williams on it. Uh, and yeah, registration is open and we're already over halfway full. So get your teams in. It's going to be fun. Uh, Jace from Gypsy Tales is going to be there. And if things are going to go sideways, he's probably going to get into the course lights real early. So uh, yeah, get on that. And uh, yeah, Zach, I think you got an event to uh, plug for us as well. Well, absolutely, man. You hit the nail on the head. Mesquite MX over there has got it going on this year. And uh, we're excited to be a part of it. Everybody knows World Mini is that's the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And April 4th through the 7th, it's going to be back at Mesquite MX. Um, I was looking at the post today. Dude, I got to get my hands on one of those trophies. I'll fight a little kid to get one of those trophies. But it's like I grew up in the, the plaque era. They're mm -hmm. falling off the wall. You see how blank my wall is? It's because they're all falling apart, man. I need a big old trophy. And uh, you guys can get one of your very own out at World Mini. I'm trying to trying to find a way. I'm going to hop in Brad's suitcase. I'm going to mm -hmm. uh, jump in the back of Brent Stallo's car. I'm going to find a way out there. Uh, but you guys might hear me calling a little bit of the action. And uh, who knows, man, maybe I'll break out and take the KX with me and just see what I can do. I tell you this much. If, if you do, in fact, end up uh, on the loudspeaker, people will hear you, but they will not see you because uh, every single one of the Mesquite MX events, it runs like a Swiss watch. They have uh, sight laps at 730. And then from then, it's just motos, 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 motos. They have it down to an absolute science of how to get people off the track. Um, they call them the uh, the Delta Rabbits that uh, kind of coordinate things and herd people off the track. Uh, there's not a single um, moment of daylight that's missed when it comes to Mesquite MX. And it's a place so nice. We're going there twice. At the beginning of the year, the first two uh, events on the Shred Tour, that's the Gypsy 500 and World Mini. We brought that baby back because every a popular demand. Let's go straight into some breaking news. And uh, yeah, let's break things off with uh, a racer that now is the proud owner of the highest win percentage uh, possible and uh, in, in, in 450 Supercross history. Never before has someone entered the 450 class, their very first race in that class, and won it. Uh, for those who are a little bit scratching their heads because they might have seen Josh Grant's story and said, hey, I went out and won Anaheim 1 back in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on a Joe Gibbs racing Yamaha. Well, unfortunately, uh, Josh uh, must be just forgetting the fact that he rode Seattle in uh, uh, 2008 on a, uh, a Geico Honda, or I guess at that point, I don't know if it would have been Geico in 08. I think it would have been Connection Honda, maybe. It's factory connection. It was always factory connection, but I think they were Torco, if I'm not mistaken. They they changed like there was a different company on this on the shrouds for a bit there, uh, when they were sort of uh, shuffling some things around. So I think that might have been a Torco, uh, factory connection, uh, 450. But he did race it. He got sixth. Therefore, not his debut, uh, in 09. And then same thing with uh, Ken Roxon. Of course, he goes out 2014, wins Anaheim one over top of James Stewart, who went absolutely hurtling through the whoops that day. Uh, right in next to the uh, uh, mechanics area. And uh, yeah, a lot of people were claiming that one, but unfortunately he was on a 350 in 2013, finishing out the season uh, on uh, on the West Coast, or I guess that was the East Coast. Um, he won the West Coast Championship. So uh, yeah, he must have uh, done some racing on the, the opposite coast on a 350. Those were his debut rides. He didn't win those races. That's why Jet Lawrence is the first racer to win their 450 debut in Supercross. Congratulations to him. Absolutely. And uh, I feel like the the debate about the title has honestly taken away a little bit from just how impressive his riding was. Um, but there have been some good points made. Obviously, um, I don't know if you followed Josh Grant on social media. He was a little bit salty about the, yes. you know, the announcements being made. And, and here's the reason I somewhat get where he's at. Somebody pointed out on, on X, Twitter, whatever you call it, um, Jet Lawrence also raced an entire outdoor national season yeah. and then the big one for me is he raced those three smx finales 
And, and for me, if the industry and the, the series promoters and everybody are trying to make this one grand SMX series, I think that there is room for argument. And so um, obviously neither one of us are high enough up on the food chain to really make a decision. Nobody really cares what we think, but I'm still going to tell you. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I knew Jet was good. I knew he was going to be good at A1. We all saw the jump in practice. Um, but as far as the the title goes and everything like that, uh, as far as the first debut 450 race, because he also raced in Paris. I know that's not an American race, but like okay. he's starting yeah. to rack up gate drops here on the 450, um, both outdoors and indoors. I do think there's a little room for argument. But one thing that you cannot argue with, the dude hauls the mail. He is going so fast and he looks so effortless doing it. Um, not what the rest of the field wanted to see. I'll put it like that. Certainly. So we got. 11 rounds of outdoors, two round, two uh, more cross designations, Paris Supercross, and uh, and then you also have three SMX rounds. So that's uh, 14 with the SMX plus two and one. I'm not great at math, but I think that's 17 full races um, in the on a 450. Uh, of course, that's different disciplines and this, that, and everything. It doesn't change the stat. But uh, like I'm not putting an asterisk, asterisk on it, but it's not like like literally like when James Stewart rode in 2005, that was the first professional race that he lined up on a four on a 250, and of course uh, he ended up winning. Um, it wasn't wasn't uh, Orlando was his first win. It was Seattle of that year, but he missed a bunch of rounds due to a fractured arm. So I think he won his like third or fourth race ever on a on a 250 two stroke. Um, so like uh, just going through some moto history there, but regardless, the stat is what it is. Congratulations to Jet. Uh, it's the first of very many. Uh, how many? That's that's yet to be told. Um, and honestly, like like it's a good thing that he kind of stole the show with that because otherwise, all we would be able to walk away from from the breaking news would be our next two stories is that Fox uh, released maybe one of the most polarizing sets of gear that's ever existed under the sun. Um, their comment section was. Um, cruel to say the least uh there was there like it was it was a it was a dichotomy of people who are really interested to see what like this next level of innovation is from a company that um is taking a unique approach to the gear everyone was wondering how you get in there it was essentially a flap off the back of the jersey it's actually kind of neat how to get it how christian gets in there um and obviously you'd have to be a pretty schvelt individual to get into this thing like i don't think you or i are pulling off this gear nearly as well as uh 165 pound christian craig are, are, is wearing it but uh the ones he kind of makes sense like and it, it it's not all one material it has a different material at the and it has a like there's a interior buckle that does go that does like it comes around your waist so um it's kind of like a, almost like a wetsuit i guess for for surfing like it's not a totally new concept but for motocross it is and i liked it yeah, it's definitely got some uh, some interesting points. Um, I agree with what you're saying in the sense of um, Christian's probably the perfect model for this yeah. um, as far as body type goes. Um, now, I will say as a taller rider, um, as much as I love the El Hombre jersey flowing in the wind, um, that's something I struggle with as well as keeping the jersey tucked in. So some of that I could see, uh, you know, some of the taller riders maybe leaning that way. But I do agree with you in the sense of I think you're going to see – the diehard racers really may be considering this. Um, I'm sure the guys over at Fox and everybody, I'm sure that there are performance um, reasonings behind putting the amount of money that goes into this uh, to be able to release a product like that. And, and I'm curious, um, I, I haven't really seen a lot from Craig post A1. Um, and as much as I'd love to talk about his riding, which I know wasn't as great as he would like, I would be curious to see his opinion on the on the outfit uh, you can't even say gear set now but um you know and just how it performed because i do think um it all being connected uh, i remember jacob hayes even pointing out to me some of the things that they do on the starting gate before they you know when they're getting ready and, and pulling your pants up as far as you can um by the front because it, jacob the way he explained it to me was when you hit the gas even just the the inch or so from your pants sliding when the inertia changes it can throw your body weight off and it can cause the front end to come up. And, and that's how, that's how fine these guys are, are breaking down yeah. each and every aspect of racing. And so um, obviously Fox racing, no stranger to the field. They've been on the fr forefront of innovation for a long time. And um, you know, as much as the motocross community does not love big changes, 
Um, I'm excited to see it. I love a company willing to take some risks to try some new things out. I love that Christian was not only willing to, you know, put himself out there and use himself as a as a test rider for it, um, but really got excited. Um, obviously, they've got a pretty big social following as well. And so um, really showing it off is showing what it can do, showing the way it looks on on the rider, on the rider's wife. Everybody was trying that thing on. I'd like to know how many people got in that suit before it actually hit the track. Um, but there's some DNA, yeah, DNA swabs that are that are necessary at this point. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely, and I mean, there was a bunch of people checking it out. I know uh, Chris Kiefer, even with Kiefer Inc., he went over there, and that's where I first saw the buckle on the inside as well. So right. um, I do think that there's more um, adjustability and more things going on than meets the eye from the outside. Like you said, I don't personally see myself getting into that. I don't know if I see. I don't know if it's vet friendly. Yeah, your average blue collar guy who's drinking a couple cold ones between rides and stuff like that. Maybe got a little bit of a. How would this look on Stu Baylor? In the gut. Now that's an interesting. Yeah, Stu Baylor. I'm not sure that would that would be his style. You know, I don't think he likes the super tight fitting. No. Um And so you know, but you never know. He Stu might be the guy the guy to like to let you know exactly what he's packing with him. So. Uh-huh. Um, but nonetheless, like I said, I'm excited to see Fox taking some chances, trying some new things out. Um, and and who knows, that might be the thing in 2027. You never know. Everyone was wondering who was going to be Privateer X. The last Privateer to leave his, 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 the rest of his Privateer brethren behind in the pits for the rest of the night show when the gate dropped for the main event. We found out that was the 81 machine of Cade Clayson um, racing for the PRMX team. He's been there for a number of years now. In fact, I think that's the second time he's back with that team. He puts it in the main. He looked ecstatic about it. Who who wasn't happy about that result was the guy who was about, I don't know what, four feet behind him. That's uh, the, the six, the 96 machine of, uh, of, of Hunter Lawrence. Um, Not the way you want your 450 career to start basically a polar opposite to his younger brother. Well, and and I'm glad that you pointed that out because uh, if you guys listen to our preseason show, that was one of the things I talked about was the the tension that maybe isn't there yet. And I don't I don't want to be the guy that's stirring the pot. I, I hope this doesn't come to fruition. I hope that they stay as good as close and as um, you know much of a family effort as they can. But you go back to Chase Sexton at Honda. He talked about how difficult it is to have a ton of success on one end of the rig and to not have a ton of success, which meant second, by the way, uh, on the other side of the rig. It's it's very difficult to deal with. Now you take that small group that was factory Honda and you take it and you make it even smaller where it's just the Lawrence family. Very, very family rooted group. Um, and I love it. I'm a big fan of the Lawrences and the entire family and what they've done. But the thing that I feel like really sucks for Hunter's situation in this was it wasn't entirely his fault. Now we'll get into the freezy first turn controversy, whatever. First sure. turns are, are arguably, you know, one of the most dangerous spots of the entire race because everybody's, you know, everybody's battling for real estate, not to mention it's also round one. So everybody's starting off with zero points. I mean, say what you will about Vince, but he got a great start and he was trying to trying to make the most of it. Um, what stinks for Hunter though is, I think the night got started off on a bad foot with that. I really don't know what happened with his last chance qualifier start. I haven't heard anything about it, but it just, it it wasn't where it needed to be. He was way towards the back coming in the first turn. And I don't care how skilled of a rider you are. We've seen this with, with Ryan Villapoto before you get in those last chance qualifiers. It's, it's chaos out there. And so um, I think Hunter did a good job of staying cool, calm and collected in the beginning of the race he didn't get caught up in any of those early catastrophes, and and he was he was laying it down. He was coming towards the front, but yeah, it's it's a bummer. Too little, too late. Um, I don't think there's any question that he's got the speed, and I'm sure if you're in the Lawrence corner, if you're with Factory Honda, you're reinforcing that. Hey, we know you got what it takes. Um, it's a bummer that that was his debut. I, I like Hunter. I feel like Hunter's a hard worker, and and that is just that's got to be a tough pill to swallow. And then you know, throw a mouthful of sand in on top of that where little brother just lays it down. And I mean, you talk about things going wrong and things going right. Got the start, made it happen, got the gap, made it happen, got the finish. And so, um, you know, it, it's got to be got to be tough for Hunter. Um, and I just hope that that doesn't ever lead to any animosity between brothers, because it's like sometimes it just seems like Hunter can't catch a break. 
Meanwhile, all those breaks go over to little brother Jet. So we'll see. But, yeah, as far as Cade Clayson goes, I don't want to take anything away from him. The guy's a racer. Uh, he also got caught up in some of that first-turn controversy. I'm not sure where yeah, he Yeah, it was on the outside looking in. Yeah, but he was definitely towards the back of the pack. He's a racer. He's a brawler, and, and he showed up and did exactly what he needed to do. He protected the lines. I'm glad to see that he didn't roll over for Hunter Lawrence. Uh, you know, we're all racers out here. We're all trying to make something happen. And so, yeah, a great job for Cade. And uh, for Hunter, we'll see it round two. He's going to come out with a vengeance. I'll put it like that. Oh, yes. Um, counting down the days. And he's probably also counting down the water droplets because I don't know if you looked at the uh, forecast, but I think it's raining in San Francisco now. It's planning on raining on Wednesday. And it's basically 40% chance of showers the entire weekend. Uh, moving on to a, uh, a, sec a section of the show uh, that we're going to call something once we actually get a proper name for it let's call this the uh uh the verb line like uh, people can leave leave a comment on the verb line they can uh they can submit questions they can submit them to at brad at verbmoto.com uh you can do that there as well as we'll uh, post out on social media uh canvassing some questions i was able to uh get some questions going uh so we'll start things off with james dalman from buffalo new york who determines when the gate falls? Is it random? Is it a set time? You know? That is, I, I believe it's up to the person in the doghouse. Correct? He's, got, he's got between one and five seconds to drop it. And that is, yep. it's completely to his discretion. Obviously five seconds being the longest amount of time that they can wait, but uh, it is in, in a way random, but it has to be within that. So like the longer you wait, the more likely it is, it's going to, it's about to drop, but I've seen, the card goes sideways, she drops. And then you and I have both seen a couple of uh like five seconds is a long time when the when the revs are up. Uh Absolutely. waiting for things to drop. Um obviously famously guys like uh Michael Essie known to just sort of like be watching and like, oh it's your it's around three seconds. It is basically just count to three and they and they dump it. Um and uh that's to me that's that's never really worked. Uh, when you do a start, do you, do you watch the pin or do you watch the gate? So my, me personally, I tried the pin and I, I was going diagonally off the start. I'm very much go where I look. Um, mm -hmm. you talk about people timing the start, Keith Harrison, the man has won a couple of red lens titles off of timing the start. Um, I don't know whether he's been disqualified for any. Yeah, of that, that's that's skirting the rule a little bit, but yeah, yeah I get there's you. definitely, and I, I and I'm on the board with that. I feel like there is a there's a gray area where it's like, hey, you got to respect the commitment to risk your entire race, but there's also there's almost too perfect of timing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely uh, for me, I just try to to look dead in the center of the gate. I usually try to pick out a mark or something that I look at, um, and then actually. Um, for a while, even at Loretta's, I was I looked past the gate. So I actually looked towards the end of the rut after the gate. Um, and, and then your peripheral, uh, supposedly you something move, you just dump it. Supposedly, yeah, your peripheral, you actually have quicker reaction time. And so um, I, I had heard from several people try looking in front of the gate um, and I got a top five start in, in all my motos. So might be wow. something there to it. Um, but yeah, you talk about different start strategies and, and timing as far as the person in the doghouse, which is the center box between the two sets of gates. Uh, Travis Pastrana comes to mind in one of his later Supercross races. I think it was kind of a, a last appearance. Uh, you could probably tell me more than I could. I know he was he was back and was actually lined up next to the doghouse and was peeking at the doghouse. And the the operator noticed it and faked Travis out went like he was going to hit it and Travis went for it. And then he actually hit Boom. it and Travis, terrible start. Yeah. And so um, it's the, it just goes to show sometimes timing it, no matter how foolproof you think it might be, doesn't always go to plan. Um, and that's why those guys train so hard for reaction time uh, to be first to the first day. Uh, Pastrana has got to be at the top of the list of guy of guys that just, that never got a two fifty a four fifty uh, super cross win. Right. I would think so. I would like think him, Tim Ferry, Guy Cooper. Is that it? Ernesto Fonseca. Did Way ever win a 450? No. No. Lots of podiums, so. though. Yep. Uh, Villeman won a 450? Yeah, yeah, like six of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was a time when Villeman was leading the points in 2000. Yeah, I, I knew he was up there. I just couldn't remember if he was on a four stroke yet or not. 
Oh no, yeah, yeah. Uh he wouldn't have won one on a four stroke. Uh all of his wins would have been on a two stroke. Yeah. Uh his last win would have been uh might have been 02. I don't think he won one in 03. He's kind of became a non factor shortly after that, like just injuries and then then like Chad came up and this whole that whole thing. Um all right. Uh Adam Banks from St. Paul, Minnesota, not too far from where I'm at. Um, has there ever been a more racing menace or been a racing menace in motocross history, uh, like Vince freeze. Now that's cool. That's an interesting question. I don't think there's ever been someone quite like Vince at specifically in Supercross. There's been plenty of guys in arena cross that have sawn each other's front ends off. Hell, like you mentioned him earlier, Jacob Hayes, he's played some, uh, uh, bagged some fibulas and whatnot. Um, Bud man, although not known for that, but he he dole it out. Um Big Bad Bowers is first. Thing yeah, I'm thinking the, Bowers the, would probably be yeah. the guy who's who's was more was most adept to like uh not shying away from the physicality of the sport and like hell no everyone knows that uh that West Coast title between him and Cooper Webb, those guys were uh like they were they were having words on the track, they were having words off the track, like like that's probably the last time that I like really paid attention to the post race interviews because like they had some words for each other, uh, calling each other out. This that was that that was a fun time in racing. Uh, but is there anyone that comes to mind for you? Well, maybe Tyler Evans, one punch. Okay. Um, I now the now you point out a, a good thing with Vince. The the thing that I think frustrates so many people about Vince is how competitive he actually is. Like the guy yeah. is fast. I mean, I I would love if you could. If you could look into an alternate universe where Vince Freezy does not have any of these, you know, any of the reputation that he does, and he runs a clean race each and every time, I would be curious to see the public perception of Vince, the teams that Vince ends up on, and and just the the overall path of his career. Um, but besides, you know, yeah. Tyler, and that was a little before my time. Um, you know, that was, I was young. I mean, I remember from Supercross the movie, but, uh, you know, I don't quite know how bad. Yeah. Casey that might've been played up slightly. Yeah. I was in the mix for that, but, uh, um, no, to, to your point about, uh, Bowers, I remember in that battle with Cooper Webb, he did an interview, uh, shortly after that big 180 collision where, where he cut in Casey super going the other way. Uh, well, you know, and he said, uh, is I'm pretty sure direct quote was somebody's got to play the bad guy and I'm willing to play the part. And yeah. and it's it's funny because I think a lot of people have always looked at Cooper Webb as kind of the bad boy there for a while growing up. And then this this arena cross guy came in. He's got the the nine one one on the plates. And not to mention, you talk about just a physically imposing guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, him, him and Weston Pike, I wouldn't like to see in the tunnel afterwards. But uh, and and Pike, arguably, maybe another one. I, I don't think he's as known on the intimidation factor, yeah, on the maybe not on the and the willingness to go there. I think, yeah. and I, I have tons of respect. You take Barsha, who Barsha. Are, Barsha should be in the mix as well. Anderson, he's no slouch, he's known to, he's known to make a little contact if needed. But just, right. I mean, first resort is the takeout. I would have to say, there's nobody like Vince. No, there really isn't. And and also, like, to your point, uh, he's one of the only guys who's ever done it, like, at the front of the field. There's lots of guys who, like, hey, like, there's there's a Vince Freeze in every single LCQ that, like, of someone who cross jumps and is, like, fighting for their position. They're, they probably should have got sixth in this race, but they got the whole shot and they're just hanging on. So they're just, like, eh, jumping le left and right to try and hold on to it. You and I would be doing the same um but yeah there's very few people who've done it in the, the the top 10 of a 450 or 250 supercross uh he's the thorn in a lot of the sides um next question on the verb line you've got uh daniel goodbranson for all the way from jacksonville florida um what would you like to see added to the night show for purely entertainment and he says thanks love the show uh, thank you, Daniel. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Like any ideas of something that you'd like to see, whether you're, uh, the, you could take this from two perspectives, one, you're in the stadium and this, like, they could sort of like eat up some of that downtime. Cause like, if you're watching the broadcast, there is a generous amount of time and that, that there's just track work being done and whatnot, uh, that you're not really looking at a whole lot, uh, up here in Canada, we literally don't even have commercials. So it's literally, you're just watching like a stadium shot from like 200 yards away. Um, but, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's I'm going to be honest, it has been longer than I'd like to admit since I've been able to go to a Supercross in person. And so as far as the the in-person experience goes, 
Um, I don't really have a lot of room to critique. I am, I am big, ooh, lights, flames. Um, you know, I, I think one of my all-time favorites was the, uh, was the Chad Reed intro with Tate riding around with him. Um, as far there. as the entertainment stuff goes, I, I really enjoyed that. Now, um, I did go to Charlotte SMX in person. Uh, that's, that's right in my backyard. And I was a little underwhelmed with opening ceremonies. Um, but I think a lot of people were, and I've heard just that a day race. Yeah, it was a yeah, day, day race. race. Doesn't yeah, count. It's just, there's, there's a lot to it. I mean, it was, it was sunset, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but as far as, as far as just pure entertainment goes from, uh, from the home, home standpoint, um, I always like when they flip to the, to the junior challenge. Um, obviously I don't want to watch the whole race, but I do like when they include the highlights, maybe include some interviews from the kids. Um, I, I, as much as, as much as you and I may not really appreciate that a ton, I do know all the kids that get to stay up. I mean, that was, I, I loved supercross races because I got to stay up late. I got to stay up and watch the race with dad. And, um, you know, that was always a thing for me was it was like, man, look, those, those kids are doing it like they're out there. And so um, now there's a risk with that, as as you and I both know from interviewing children. Sometimes you get an incredible interview and sometimes you get the good old mom yep. and dad. Yeah. And, yeah. And then they just they just hold that and for a good 15 seconds. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to balance. But I do like seeing the kids. I like seeing that they're out there and having a good time. Um, but besides that, man, I really don't know what else they'd have time for. I think that is the biggest issue right now is they're on such a time crunch. Um, I know for a fact, uh, in, inside James Stewart's head and, and Lee Diffie and, and Will and all of them, they have people saying, Hey, 15 seconds. Hey, you, I mean, every single thing is timed, whether people realize it or not. Um, so it'd be, it'd be difficult to find something predictable enough to squeeze into that packed schedule. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I know in the past they they did a uh, when Jägermeister was a sponsor of both the series and uh, there was a Jägermeister uh, freestyle team. They did a freestyle demo. And uh, that was also back in the days of like a few guys were flipping and like most guys are doing like Cordovas and cliffhangers and stuff like that. But uh, I would always be a fan of that. Like maybe not every round, but like like three rounds let's do like a best whip contest contest and like bring out guys like tyler bearman and and colby raha and stuff like that i think that would be a neat wrinkle um i know of course they've done that uh, in the the pits during the day well bring those guys out for the evening like there's uh different perspectives i think that'd be a cool opportunity uh to sort of add uh some different perspective perhaps uh and i've yeah. always wondered why they don't have um guys like like axel or bearman uh, why they have never been interested in doing any kind of transfers or anything like that. Yeah. It's like like I, I was always very capable of, the data of transfers. And, and clearly if you've seen Red Bull imagination, those boys are not afraid to send it deep. And yeah. so I, I could easily see with their skills on a motorcycle, those guys really coming up with some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Axel's hurt right now. Is he not? Did he break a leg? Yeah. He, he had a bad one, bad femur break. Yeah. Bad, bad. So uh, yeah. Uh, thoughts with him. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk, like go through the classes, go through the talking points. I'm going to pull up the results for the 250 class. Um, he celebrated his uh, 75th birthday the night before the race. Uh, RJ Hampshire, I'm joking, he's not 75, but um, let's be honest. Like he, he's a veteran in the class. He's been around for a long time, um, and, and and he earned himself a win. He was by by and large the the best guy out there. He led all but one lap. Uh, the other, uh, the other, the the whole shot and uh, coming across the finish line the first for the first lap was none other than the nine twenty nine of Julian Bomer out of uh, Lake Havasu, Arizona. That's wild to see. Uh, great to see a young man. Obviously, he's got the starts locked in, and that is super cool because uh, he's going to be a factor of pretty much like if you can get starts, you're going to be a factor of the rest of your career. Uh, so that's uh, good to see from him. They, they have him from Marietta, but I'm sure that's just the house that he's renting right now. Um, but yeah, like right off the hop, let's talk RJ. Let's talk uh, Jordan Smith between the two of those guys, like just flashbacks to like war machines back when those guys were like just tip to tail ripping through the sand. Like how many laps of those guys spun together? And then they're on uh, they're on competing teams competing for the same championship uh, nine years into pro careers. Yeah, those guys have probably got to have a lot of respect for another by now. Obviously, um, I, I'm sure they're I'm sure they're probably 
acquainted. I don't know if they're friends or not, but um, I think there's got to be a respect not only for the the age in the class, but also just the the trials that both of those guys have come through. Both of them uh, have been known to hit the ground a time or 200. And uh, sometimes the ground wins with both of them. And so, um, but I also think you want to talk about similarities between them. Nobody questions their heart. Both of those guys are all in. They put in a ton of work. And uh, I was really, I was really happy to see it pay off for RJ. You know, I, I, um, it definitely did not come as a surprise. I don't think anybody could tell you that there's no chance RJ could win. I think anybody that doubts RJ was, was concerned he wasn't going to make it to the finish line without going down. And so, um, I think if he's able to continue to get good starts where he doesn't put himself into positions where he he gets into that overriding standpoint, which we've seen him go down up front before too. But I think if he can get a good start, if he can get up front within the first couple laps, um, I hope that you can see him genuinely in this title fight. Whether he comes out on top or not, you know, the pieces will fall where they may, but I just want him healthy and I want him around because not only do I think he's got a lot of skill indoors, but you look to, to the pro motocross series as well. I would love to see him come into that with a full season racing under his belt um, and show what he can do outside as well. So great job for both of them. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I said it before, man, Juju's legit. Like I, yeah. I was very, very impressed with him at Loretta Lynn's, um, not only in just his sheer speed, but the, the, the way he Intensity carries fitness. Yeah. The way he carries himself is not like somebody that is brand new to the professional ranks and say what you want. I mean, some of the memes are fantastic as far as his jet skiing pass and everything like that. But this guy's a champion. This guy is a champion in jet ski racing. Uh, and we as motocross guys may not take that as, as very serious, but I guarantee you there's championship pressure. And he took it just as serious back then as he takes motocross racing now. And yeah. so look out for maybe him not making those rookie mistakes. It hasn't been on dirt, but this guy's been in a championship fight before. He's been up against, you know, the best of the best in a field before. And uh, he's clearly shown he's got the technical speed. He's got the fitness and he's got the intensity. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what the 929 is able to bring. Yeah, he's got a great team behind him, too. Uh, he's factory uh, Red Bull KTM. So, you know, he's going to have uh, good equipment, consistent uh uh package week to week to week with uh, great people around him um complete side note but uh as far as like this is a world championship we know it's a world championship there was only uh but the it was there was a lot of red white and blue in this particular race all but i believe three racers were uh from the states you had one canadian in mission vc's uh julian bennick uh, you had another Frenchman uh, or a Canadian in Cole Thompson, the 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 seventy one machine, uh, out of uh, Bridge Bridgeton, Canada, as uh, Ontario, and then uh, a French rider as well. Actually, there was four. So uh, the um, Japanese product of Smoke and Joe Shimoda, uh, like that flagship ride that the the uh, the first ride on the Honda. Um, got to imagine that he was looking for a little bit more. Frustrating night for Joe. Definitely got to be frustrating. Um, I, I think I feel like factory Honda is on such a confidence high in all aspects of their racing that I don't feel like they're easily shaken. Um, I, I feel like Jet or not, uh, excuse me, Joe, I'm sorry, made some mistakes. I feel like he rode rather tight. Even even what I saw of him before the race day started, he just didn't look like he was you know, Joe flowing. And I mean, he's got a very good style. He's very, um, he's got a good body language where you can, you can almost tell when he's in it and he's feeling good. Um, and, and people don't say he can't get that on the Honda because I do feel like he had that in Paris. Now, obviously sure. a different field, but, um, I, Joe's also another one of those guys where I feel like he's a slow roller. I think he's going to take some notes. He's going to go back to the board. He's going to improve next week. He's going to improve at round three. Um, and sure enough, he's going to start sneaking into that title conversation because he's able to limit those mistakes and be there week in and week out. So I definitely feel like a little underwhelming as far as just the results for Shimoda. Um, but I think they're they're confident. I think they've got a good base. And I think that there will be, be more to come from the number 30 or whatever it looks like from afar. But uh, I'm going to blame it on the font. That's why it happened is the, is the number font. But yeah. uh, no, another team that I was really glad to see have a good showing was, was Mitch over pro circuit. Um, Been a while since we had two guys in the top, like two of them on the yeah. podium. 
And how about both of them being his new guys? I think that yeah, was cool. That's got to feel good. You know, uh, not only for Mitch, but for those guys as well. First of all, where the hell did Max Boland come from? I mean, yeah. the different guy. guy. I can like only I, totally I can only assume guy. that that was someone else racing last year. I genuinely like it, it was a reminiscent of Brock Tickle back out there on the number 20. It just it looked good. Um, but that's awesome for him. I know he hadn't had the performance on the 250s like he wanted. Um, I think there's a lot of, of familiarity and comfort with Pro Circuit, obviously, with with the family ties he has to that as well. But to go out here at round one and really make a statement that was that was exactly what I said he needed to do. Uh, Levi Kitchen, he had that mistake in the in the heat as well. Um, but same thing, just the the intensity to come back towards the front of the field after that mistake was a was a great sign from Levi. No question, he's got speed. Um, and so I think it's good to see not only the the riders feeling good, but good to see that those green machines are back in the contention for fighting. Obviously, we talk about how um, how tough it is to have a competitive bike in the 250 class and. I'm going to be honest for the last little bit, you know, it was, it was star Yamaha. They were, they were killing it. And, and it almost seemed unfair how fast those bikes were. And Honda has really stepped it up with their program, obviously on the 250 side. Um, and then, you know, pro circuit really into the mix as well. Clearly KTM's here to play as well. And then Husky white KTM, whatever you want to call it on the top of the box. So for me, it's like, man, the manufacturers are in, the bikes are good. The riders are good. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about 450s, but I think this 250 class on both coasts is going to be really fun to watch as well. Oh, it's going to have to be because uh, there might be a guy in the 450 class that we're going to get to. It might make things a little bit uh, more difficult to come up with some compelling storylines um, as we've seen in the past, although things can change at the drop of a hat. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to uh, three riders that... Uh, did not end the, the night the way they wanted to. And you mentioned this during our, our preview pod um, of, of reusing numbers over at the uh, at the Club MX team. Not, all, not, not one, not two, but three numbers from last year that they had under the, like, so they had 26, that was Alex Martin. Did they have 26 last year? Who ran 26? Was Alex oh. still... Alex still had Alex it, and so no one ran it last year. Maybe it was March Banks that was twenty six. No, March Banks last year was was thirty six. Thirty six. Yeah. yeah. So that now Nicoletti's thirty six, and then they have Mar March Banks is now twenty six. He's running uh, Mar Martin's old twenty six, and then the 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 sixty nine is Cody Shock, who's also on the team. Like, like at at some point someone's getting on the wrong damn motorcycle there, there's no there's no two ways about that you have like maybe a groggy morning um you, you you got a few things in your mind someone is swinging the leg over the wrong bike um and unfortunately things went super wrong for philip nicoletti and it, uh, an electrical issue he's a dns no points on the night which is uh, that's the biggest bummer is that you, you don't even get a point for making it into the main event uh thrasher uh i thought that was a collarbone he went to Indonesia and went straight to the side of his shoulder. That is the mechanism that breaks your collarbone. He comes out unscathed, although on a D, basically a DNF either way. One point for his troubles, the 57 machine laying next to the track. Um, and then the bigger qu question, and uh, you can let me know how you feel about this. Honestly, I wasn't overly concerned about it because it, it seemed that they once they had it under control, no one was in real danger. Lux Turner goes down hard. Um, he's out of, uh, like, uh, Gardenville, uh, Nevada. And, uh, yeah, he, he had himself, uh, like at the end of his night that like, I guess that's a pro debut as far as Supercross goes, uh, not what he was looking for. Um, I don't know the exact extent of his injuries, but it, like it was red cross flags. Uh, a few guys used that to their advantage. Um, like it was right in the middle of a long rhythm section. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's what I was about to say. As far as the the Lux crash goes, uh, I'm in the same boat. I haven't seen any post race update really as far as injury goes. Um, I do know it it looked pretty bad. I've seen it was a pretty terrible clip online, but I did see a clip of of something happening and it looked like a very hard hit. Um, but yeah, I think know. the the bigger uh, controversy surrounding that crash is is the the Red Cross flags and the way that it was handled. Um, now, obviously. I at least haven't heard anything as far as uh, J-Bone and anybody over at the AMA handing anything down. Um, and I feel like with the the rise in penalties over the last couple of years and then really trying to, to make a push to, to get the riders to take this seriously, um, I, I'm 
I'm a little torn. It, it's uh, I've seen some different things online. You know, everybody's got their opinion. A lot of people say that they think the Red Cross should have been extended all the way to the end of the uh, to the rhythm section. Um, that's not I don't, how the flag works. Right. And that's exactly how I feel is I'm like, well, you know, the, the primary goal is just to make sure that the rider is not in harm's way. And if you're past the rider. Or if you're not to the rider yet, the biggest thing like was right off the hop is that they didn't have the Red Cross flag until after the three in. So right. then that's then that's where Bolin ended up getting passed because he didn't do the three in because he sees he sees the right. um the Red Cross coming up. So he doubles. But his teammate, um, Levi Kitchen, does three in. And then from there, he rolls. And as soon as he's past the red flag, he jumps, which is following the, the rule to the letter. Now, the question comes in, should they have started the, like, should they have just extended that, that zone to have the red cross flag earlier? So basically just eliminate that entire rhythm section to have wheels on the ground from tip to tail of that entire section. Maybe, but then you can't, you can't penalize riders if as an officiating crew they make some sort of an error in that situation the rider shouldn't have to pay for that yeah i i agree completely and and from what i have heard from the various inter uh, interviews that jay bone and um several others have done regarding just the way the ama handles this stuff i'm sure there's probably a meeting going on at some point sure. as far as is you know hey how did we handle this how could we handle it better um i think the the commitment factor is something that's often not talked about in the sense of these guys oftentimes are, are committing to a three in or to a, a three on off, whatever they're committing to that midway through the rhythm section before, whether they're lining up to go to the outside or, or whatever. And so right. the, these riders ride so far ahead that it, it is hard to, to properly gauge because you take somebody like Volan who, who was able to look ahead. He was able to, to catch a glimpse of that um and then to the same point while levi you know levi had already committed and and you know i'd be curious to to have the ability to know what was going on in levi's head whether he was like it's too late like i've got to go by the time he realized it um and to your point as soon as he landed yeah he rolled he, he shut it down um but a lot of times these these tracks they're they're so you hear about riders putting together the track this section to this section right. and so it's very difficult to judge where exactly those lights should start because um and, and for me just in my my two cents um i think the ama have enough experienced staff now to where they're able to say hey riders have to commit to this jump the corner in front so if somebody goes down between here and here we need to extend it all the way to the corner um but I, i'm going to put my trust in the ama and and those guys and and say that uh for the for my primary point is i'm glad everybody was okay I'm yep. hoping the best for Lux. I'm glad that nobody else was caught up in it. I'm glad that nobody else was penalized in it and it played a role in the race. Um, but there's always room for improvement. It's a dangerous sport. Any way we can try to improve safety, I think, is is a good discussion to have, whether it leads to anything or not. Um, and so that's that's pretty much my only takeaway from the, from the crash. Uh, from what I understand, I think Lux is going to be okay. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think it's, if anything, just a talking point for the AMA and um, for the crew over there. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, like even if you are to take notes from that situation, uh, no two crash situations are totally alike. Like, had he crashed uh, 10 feet closer to the corner, maybe you flag it different, maybe it goes further. My question for you, though, when it comes to, like, commitment, at what point in the track do you think that Jet committed to jumping that five on press day? Um, was it, like, coming out of the corner after that section itself? Because, like, I'd have to be committed to jumping that like last week because right. like yeah like that was that was a send of all sends like when when james stewart's giving you props and saying like shout out to you like he he what's the distance on that like well, it's gotta know, be it's way. gotta be about 20 feet per three footer like a three footer is is basically what the height of the of the, of the smalls usually about five feet for the bigs like when they say like big to big that's a five footer to a five footer small like uh small to big three footer to a five footer they're about 20 feet apart so if he does five is that 100 feet i was about to say it's got to be a close uh approach it's got to be there's no way that it's not like it's it's way it's a lot further than your average triple the average yeah. triple is 65 feet um if it was 30 would you say it's 30 percent further 
I'd have to look at it again, but that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, was... I, like, I'm just, just as like, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't there to pace it out myself, but I'm thinking that's got to be in the, in the realm of oh, 95 to a hundred feet. Um, and, and to get stopped, like, it's actually kind of nice that he like kind of hung a wheel because that's what helped him get stopped. Um, otherwise he absolutely greased it. Uh, and let's just jump straight into the 450 class and talk about the kid, the 18 program in your program. Uh, he's got uh, lime green numbers now um because that's the world we live in uh, i'm not uh, that's maybe like the only thing that i don't love uh because like a factory honda is just such a beautiful beautiful piece of machinery um and anything that is done to like not make it so and then people are like oh what about the camel uh plate from the 90s well like uh yellow and navy blue look good together um i i respectfully disagree about purple and high vis yellow um and apparently he'll be running a red plate with the high vis yellow numbers uh in San Fran. Um, but regardless, that is just a cosmetic whatever. Um, the reality is the man went out, he set fastest lap times. He did he win his heat race? No. Yeah. Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah, he qualified. Yeah, he, yeah. Um, congratulations to him. Fantastic rides. Um, he led every single goddamn lap. Um, they only they only rode 20 laps. Oh, I guess it was about a minute. So that makes sense. Um, usually like usually at Anaheim, they're, they're closer to, uh, and they didn't use the over under or anything like that. So that's surprising that they were able to come up with uh, a layout. That's a minute long at, at Anaheim. They've we've been closer to 45 seconds, which sounds, doesn't sound like much, but 15 seconds on a track that size is like significant. Um, but honestly, like I, I was impressed with Jet. I kind of honestly, like at this point, like even though it was his first race ever on a 450 Supercross, that whole thing, uh, that was expected. What wasn't expected is Jason Anderson looking like 2021 uh, or 2018 Jason Jason Anderson and uh, Cooper Webb coming in. Oh, I don't know about 15, 20 pounds lighter than the last time we saw him in Paris and looking spicy and putting the bike where he wants it to be. Um, yeah, like. For all the the people that are on the web wagon, saddle up because it's going to be a good season. Yeehaw, baby! North Carolina came to represent. It was a good start with uh, Jordan yeah. Smith and Cooper both grabbing some wins early. But uh, yeah, I agree. I, it's funny. I found out about the the I believe it was twenty pounds. They said he lost between A one and, and Paris. Um, but I also, from what I understand, it's not like he just was on the the grinding program. Um, I think it was actually some health things like that he found out as far as I'm not sure whether it was dietary changes or what. Mm. Um, but from what I understand, he was not only you know looking a little better, but he was genuinely feeling better as well. Um, and yeah, we That's said it on, we said it on the preview, man. Cooper is a dark horse. And I liked the fact that nobody was talking about him because that's exactly what he wants. He wants mm -hmm. you to not think about him. Don't worry about him. He's not posting the Insta bangers. He's not posting any more than he's got to. And then he shows up and he reminds you exactly who he is and 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 what he's here to do. Um, and, and same thing with Jason Anderson. Like we said at the on the last show, he gets a good start to the season. Watch out. Watch yeah. out. Say what you want about the title that he got. People don't give him enough credit. Uh, it's, it's you know, uh, I, that's a whole nother discussion for a different podcast. But to me, it's like, man, this guy's legit. He's been legit. He's on a great bike. He's got time on that bike. I know it's a, it's a new model and everything like that, but he seems extremely comfortable on it. And to him, to, for him to start the season like this, I would love to see it continue. I think uh, get me through round three. Keep him inside that top three to four in points, and you know, keep it close. Be look, be on the lookout for Jason Anderson in the big end. I think he's another under the radar guy that um, is just going to kind of add to the list of of people that we expect big things from. Um, I mean, I what do you even say about Jet? Like the guy, just everything that he needed to do, he did. That's yep. that's it. Period. He executed. He executed under pressure against all the competition. But he didn't and win his heat race. He went down. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I was about to say, I because I got Cooper's crash confused with him. And so, um, but and and I love it. Like, even then, he's he doesn't it doesn't seem to rattle. short memory, dude. That's like, that's he, that's mental strength. That like I said it to somebody unraveling. His brother goes down, he goes down, like, like, and then just nope, writing the ship. See you later. I, I think uh I think you could put jet lawrence in the argument for the rider that smiles the most 
Usually it's Aaron Plessinger, I think pretty much hands down. Dude, Jed just looks like he's having a great time and he's high on life at all times. And I mean, oh. how could you not be? To be 20 years old and you got 60,000 people on their feet, you're like, I'm the best. Yeah, he's like, just, and I mean, it's oh. just, it's hard not to like the guy. He He's humble. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't gloat. He doesn't talk trash, but he does have a confidence that I really like as well. And so, what yeah. do you think of his mascot? Say that again. What did you think of his mascot? Man, we'll go back to the uh, the same thing that I said with Fox. I like that riders are doing some different stuff now. Okay. I mean, you know, say what you will. Uh, I think I think we have a bit of a tainted opinion because we are so engrossed in this sport that we yeah we've seen the hype from a lot of different people and the but uh, you know if I'm not mistaken I believe there was an MC mascot walking around at one point too wasn't there was yeah there yeah one? that was but it was after five championships. And, yeah, well, uh, and then he enough. won two more. Uh, but hey, whatever. At this point, just like it's his world. We're living in it. Uh, his his honestly, I'll say this about his mascot kind of looks like Terrence and Philip um, from <laughs> South Park. But hey, uh, like if, if you're paying two thousand dollars for his VIP program to be with the Lawrences, you need to be entertained. Um, and yeah, a, uh, a mascot. Why not? I, it's probably really hot in there. So I'm glad that they're probably put him in some some vented uh, uh, Alpine Star gear. Um, a few other guys that sort of jump off the page at me that had quietly really good nights. Aaron Plessinger, good all day, very fast. Uh, Ferrandez with a fifth was not on my uh, uh, my bingo card. And uh, I, on the opposite side of that spectrum, Eli Tomac with a ninth. And we've seen him have uncharacteristically bad opening rounds. We've seen, we saw in 2017, he started the season with a, a pair of seventh place finishes. Uh, he's certainly, he's DNF'd, uh, the very first round, um, in 2018 after going over the bars and breaking his pants. Um, so no panic button for Eli Tomac, but just, just didn't seem to be a, a, a he wasn't a strong factor all day. Yeah. I think a lot of fans had this idea that Eli was stewing with rage up in Colorado and he had a picture of jet hanging on the wall that he threw darts at, and he was going to come here at round one and just execute the kid to make a point and you don't know Eli Toma if that's what you were sitting there expecting because he's a he's a big thinker this guy is in it for championships he's in it to be there in the end and um I don't I don't think we I don't think we give enough credit to his comeback time um if you remember initially there was a lot of speculation that he would not make it back like that was going to be the end of Eli because he yeah. wasn't going to be back in time for for Supercross yeah um and and so I am curious to see whether the Achilles, whether physically or mentally, played a role into it. I know the guys, you know, he's pretty bulletproof when it comes down to it. But at the end of the day, we all have these things that creep into our minds. That was a pretty huge injury. I think that that was, I think, his biggest injury since the 2015 double shoulders. And so, yeah, hard to beat that. Yeah. And so I, I think it's both your shoulders. Yeah, that was a gnarly one. And so, um, and I'd be curious to see what his comeback race from that injury looked like, because I think Eli was taking, you know, taking, taking role, basically. Hey, how am I feeling? How's the Achilles feeling? How's the bike feeling under these race paces? Now, yeah, I, I was expecting better than ninth. Um, I think the fact that Ken Roxon went down early in the main event and was Ken 10th or 8th, I know he was right around it. 10th. Yeah. Yeah, so the fact that Kenny was able to to get right up behind him, obviously a tough night for Ken. A whole nother conversation. That was a gnarly crash that could have been much worse. Um, pretty sure he got sucked up into the back of Malcolm Stewart's bike, and so and just uh, kicking his legs. Yeah, that was that was like Ricky Carmichael getting that thing shoved up his nose. Did you see that video? Yeah, I did see that. No one. Oh, that's no terrible. One needs that. That was terrible. Uh, hope you're doing better, Ricky. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, glad to see that Ken was able to get back out there and, and continue to stay in the fight. And um, while that wasn't a great result, I don't think it puts him entirely out of contention with how deep the field is right now. Um, and so, yeah, if you're if you're Eli, just stick to your stick your guns, man. I think I think the guy's confident. I think he's I think he's walking away shaking his head like, okay, I can I can live with ninth. And so. We'll see it. We'll see the ball start to rolling more. Um, I was impressed with Cooper, Justin Cooper. Um, I, I thought he rode really well. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Ferrandis. That was another one I was going to point out. I think 
uh, not only as the rider, but the team as well. I think Phoenix, there was a lot of questions coming in and I, I was extremely impressed with them. So um, hope they can keep that going as well because uh, Dylan is another one that could be a spoiler. Hey, this race here, that race there, man, he might break out and, and put in a fight for a podium with a good start. Yeah, no, he's uh, sec second to the top Honda. In fact, uh, the only other Honda, he was the only other Honda in the class. No, wait, uh, Vince Freeze, he was out there. Uh, who uh, he, went, he ended up he going down. Yeah, yeah. He he collided with uh with with Dean Wilson. I put that on my Instagram today, uh, asking some some opinions. Honestly, like it's not like it wasn't a to it wasn't just like a, a like just I'm gonna come in and obliterate you. I would I also wouldn't just say their lines came together because that's not true either. But um, it's a uh, it's Vince Freeze trying to make an aggressive pass probably more aggressive than he needs to that early in a race. And I think that he genuinely either misjudged how deep that he was going into that corner. Like the, it is slippery at a one, like not as slippery as will be in a two, but it's, it's slippery. It's early. So you're still feeling out the bike a little bit and uh, yeah, poor choice. Honestly, poor execution on Vince's part, because if you're going to knock somebody down, you better not knock yourself down because, and he ended up knocking himself out of the race. He receives no points for it. Um, and also for that, uh, the 22 machine of Fred Nick Noren gets a point. Uh, congratulations to him. And, uh, yeah, just an early exit to the night. Um, also like completely just sort of side note, shout out to, uh, Derek Drake did not, didn't have him on my, uh, on my bingo card throwing down a 15th, um, and, uh, on the, uh, the bar X Suzuki. Yeah, Drake, uh, he's he's another one of the quiet ones. Uh, if I if I'm correct, I believe he had some health issues a couple of years ago that yeah, didn't, heart he had to come back. Yeah, the heart problems. And so um really, I mean, I think that's really cool to see him be able to come back and, and get his name back in the discussion. Um, you know, looking good on the yellow bike out there. And uh yeah, I, I think that's a, a huge thing for him to build off of. Uh, as far as the Vince thing goes, if it wasn't Vince would there be this much debate about it? I think is the the true question that we have to ask. Now I'm sure that you know you got to argue. Hey, there's patterns to this. Um, uh, the fact that it was Vince is ironic, but I agree. One thing, if you want to give Vince Freeze a compliment, he is pretty good at not taking himself down. Like yeah, this the, is a this is this is a rare occasion. The only other time I can think about it was when he took out. He ended up taking out Moosecan, who ended up also taking out Anderson in like the same heat race. And like I, there was probably a lot of profanity. Um, I remember he went down with Weston Pike and that one didn't work out for him. That didn't go well at all. It was raining down blows on him like a hockey fight. Um, if hockey fights were played like with someone turned to your back. Um, the number one, I mean, we didn't really talk about him, Chase Sexton with uh, with the podium. I'll take it based on like his confidence level rolling in and just overall what we were expecting um yeah i i can't say anything other than i'll take it yeah i i agree i think uh that's another team that is preaching we want to win the war you know we want to do well in the battles but the goal is to win the war and so and there's no secret that i don't think that there's i don't think there's animosity between chase and jet but i think that there is you know chase left um, that's, that's a, that was a big deal. It was obvious that he was looking for a, a fresh start. And, um, so yeah, I, I think Chase is there. He's in a good spot. I think he's going to get more comfortable. Um, and for anybody that's questioning why he's got that number one, I think he's got the opportunity to prove it. So, um, I hope he can just, just stay consistent. And, uh, you know, I would really like to see a, a breakout ride from him. Um, and I'm not sure when I see it coming, but I do feel like if he's able to to get things clicking sometimes and get a good start, um, I, I think he's I think he's going to be able to give some argument. There's a lot of people speculating about, you know, here it comes the McGrath era of today, this, that and the other thing. You take the you walk away with with Eli building momentum. Kenny went down early off the race. Uh, and then you look at just Coop and Jason, who I don't think were in a lot of people's discussion. And then Chase is right there as well. Um, this thing's far from over, guys. It's round one. Oh, for sure. Yeah, Jet looked great. And I mean, he gave the he gave the sport exactly what it needed in something to talk about. And so um, it's fun to speculate, but we got a long way to go. And, and these guys are all ready to go the distance.
Absolutely. I'll say this about that whole, like, it's the Jet era, this other thing, and we very well could be in that. Um, like, Lord knows, I lived through the, the Ricky Carmichael era where you saw him dominating on a 125. Uh, obviously, he wasn't as instantly uh, successful on a 250, especially in Supercross, immediately. Uh, but when it happened, it happened. And I'll take a page out of the broadcast from 2001. The first few rounds... It's it's MC, it's Carmichael back and forth. By round nine, you listen to some of those broadcasts, and it's a far gone conclusion. The number four, and gone. See you later, bud. Um, and everyone else is is fighting for second. Uh, but for now, I think we still need to uh give some serious respect to the the competitors around him um and their ability. Like a lot of these guys, they're past champions, they're multi-time champions, uh, they're 250 champions. Um, and uh yeah, they're, they're gonna have a say in this whole thing. So um and until this guy just rattles off multiple consecutive wins um yeah we'll 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 get to be seen but uh good on uh jet lawrence for going out there and becoming the first ever to make his his 450 debut win the sucker um let's move straight into some san fran prediction uh podiums i'm gonna go first to give you my podium for the, the 250 and the 450 class uh give me Levi Kitchen with your moto with your race win, followed by RJ Hampshire. And then I think we're going to hear, see uh, a little bit more of Mr. Julien Vomir. So uh, give, give me that for your podium. And then the 450 class, I think a huge back bounce back ride for uh, for one Eli Tomac. He's done it once. He's, he'll do it again. Um, he'll win that race, go out there and get it. I think Jet Lawrence uh, rolls in at your number two spot. And then uh, give me Coop uh coop's good when we go to the bay area first time i ever saw him race in the four on the 450 class on a yamaha at that race it was eli it was it was coop uh that was seven goddamn years ago by the way uh like holy crap uh you're like wow um but yeah those guys put on a show it was oakland then it'll be san fran now uh so that, there's my there's my two podiums what do you think there's that yeah, I think those are good picks. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little different route than you, just uh, just based off of the weather predictions as well. Um, and so we'll see how this works out. The the, the 250 class. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you. I'm gonna say I'm gonna put Levi third on my okay. podium. Um, I definitely think he's up there. Um, I think i think you see shimoda bounce back i think shimoda is going to be that's the guy i left off and i'm like ah yeah. zach's gonna put him in there and be right but yeah I, and, and i mean um it, it will i feel like come around the conditions uh off the top of my head i'm not sure whether joe's particularly strong in the wetter conditions or not um but i i think i think it's going to show the the preparation that he's done and so um i'm, I'm going to put him second and then i'm going to go i'm gonna say smith gets one uh, we've Ooh. seen some strong performances. Um, we're done. Yeah, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go for it. We're gonna gonna stick to the local boys. Um, now, gonna go totally different on the four fifty side. I'm gonna say AP gets his gets his win. Um, that would be fun. You know, here's especially the thing. if it's if it's if it's legit sloppy and he just goes out and wins it. No See, visor. I, I I don't want that. Like I hope, I hope it's thick. I hope it's rutted. I hope it's soft. But I don't mm-hmm. hope it's a condition where somebody can say he Asterisk. only got risk. Oh, yeah, yeah, as a mud race, yeah. of course. Exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah, because yeah. John Dowd yeah. won a, a mud Supercross back right. in Charlotte back in the day. Right, and so I, I mean, I think I think Aaron, I think he will be maybe a little step up from his normal because of the wetter conditions. If it is damp, um, but yeah, I hope. However, it plays out. I hope he gets it where there's nobody saying, "Oh, well, it was only because of this." So I've got AP grabbing the win. I'm going to say I'm going to say Coop gets second and I'm going to say I'm going to go I'm going to go Rocks in third. I think Rocks and bounces back strong. You you're all you're all East Coast right now. I I would call Ken East Coast cuz he's based in Florida. Although he is riding we'll take full circle on this podcast. His his home base right now is in uh is in mesquite really? they built them a super cross track because of course courtney uh courtney roxon her family's from saint george utah about 30 minutes uh west of where uh of where the track's at so uh yeah like yeah that's where he's been 
Uh, of course, people are going to listen to this and then uh, go race out to Mesquite, hopefully to, uh, to get something signed by uh, the 94 machine. But uh, yeah, they built him a, a custom track and uh, him and a couple of other guys have been spinning some laps. That track looks good. All right. Well, if he's in Nevada, then maybe not quite as much uh, wet weather training, but no. we'll, we'll see. I've locked it in now, so we'll okay. see what happens. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, last question I have for you before we hang up this call. Um, if someone gave you a like a well-prepped, I call it 250 because neither one of us belong in a 450 on a supercross track um if it was just if it was just doubles no whoops supercross track like how long before you're getting around like I'm, i don't think you're tripling anything i'm certainly not tripling anything but like how long until you're able, you feel comfortable just going like double 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 around the whole track um and would you develop enough confidence to send a supercross track that's been asked before. Uh, that's, I mean, that's gotta be like probably the number one bench racing question. At a uh -huh. Would you hit that triple? Yeah. Um, would you hit that I'm thing? not, I'm not quadding closest. I'd come to quadding and getting on a four wheeler. Um, and I don't want to do that either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I actually want to do that less. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, um, I don't know those, I, I, I hate to say it, but I did watch, um, I know he's been on Grom report. Uh, who was the kid on the 65 that was hitting the triple? At oh, uh, Jaden smart. Yeah, if Jaden Smart's launching that thing lap after lap, brake tapping in the air, I think my ego, I'm either jumping it and going to the hospital or jumping it and going to the truck to celebrate. But I tell you I what, think, if he's there, you're jumping it. Exactly. It's, I'll <laughs> follow him off of it because he was perfect every single Yeah, day. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, as far as the, the double doubling go, um, I am a bit of a big boy. So I, I don't know. I might be a little hesitant for the trip on the 250. Um, but uh, yeah, the, Big old four fatty keeps me lazy. Take a nice seat on that thing and ride it off the face. Yeah, I'd probably go for it. Um, but uh, I don't expect you're going to be seeing any any style or any. Jaden Smart was throwing more of a whip than I would be off the triple. I'll put it like that. He was putting too much style into that. I was I was um, I was upset seeing it just because I'm like I, I I don't rightly know that I would like send it. I I'd probably send it that day. But like I think he was like in the second practice, like third lap, just yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was a genuine ego check because he yeah. was launching it, uh, throwing no footers over the finish line there as well. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was one of those like, wow, we are we're in for a treat over the next couple of years. I've said it before, this Stasic generation oh. is starting to infiltrate its way into the uh -huh. actual into the race world. And man, you look at what some of these kids are doing on on 65s now and it's it's mind blowing. Awesome, man. Well, let's hang up this call and do it again next week. Say, yeah. Sounds like a plan to me, man. All right. Thanks, Zach.